All right. Welcome, everybody. We are live from various places up and down the East Coast. My name is Jason Loeth. I'm the artistic director here at Only Theater Center. Well, not here, uh, at Only <laughs> Theater Center in Maryland. Uh, this was supposed to be opening night of a show we're doing at our theater called The Humans. Uh, Peter Marks, the chief critic of the Washington Post, and I were going to talk about American family drama on stage. But when the crisis hit and The Humans opening was postponed to the fall, we decided to keep the panel but bring in some other really great thinkers from the region and talk about what it's all gonna look like after the crisis passes, or at least after this wave of the crisis passes. So I'm delighted to welcome some of my colleagues, uh, Raymond O. Caldwell of Theater Alliance, a fantastic, relatively young company uh, out of Anacostia in Southeast DC. Maria Manuela Goyanes of Willy Mammoth Theater Company in downtown DC, one of the great, uh, great elder statesman of brand new theater. Uh, and I made that right up right then. Uh, and Ryan Roulette of Roundhouse Theater in Bethesda. Ryan and I go way, way back um, through the days of the National New Play Network. And now both of us are running theaters in Montgomery County. Uh, so I think with this group of folks, we've got a tremendous a uh, uh, good cross section of different kinds of theater companies throughout the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area. And with Peter Marks, the chief critic, uh, longtime chief critic of the Washington Post at the helm, this should be a great conversation. Before we begin, please feel, to free, uh, feel free to send comments and questions our way. Uh, we'll try to answer them either during or towards the end of this hour long program. And I wanna thank Creative Captioning for sponsoring this event. Uh, and providing us with ASL translation. So with all that, Peter, take us away. Thank you, Jason. Uh, it is a pleasure to see you all. Any chance I get to see the faces of theater makers, I feel reassured. Um, just you know, sitting in my room without theater is so, so hard. This is the longest I have spent without my fanny in a seat in American theater in about, I'd say, 20 years. So I'm in some kind of decompression chamber here trying to deal with it. And you're all going to help me today. I just, just a couple of things. I just want to reassure the audience that for the occasion, I'm wearing a collared shirt, which is an unusual event for me in these days. And I am wearing pants. So uh, <laughs> This is an oh, this is a safe space for uh, audiences of all ages, uh, <laughs> and um, I think that we're going to have a really interesting discussion. I have met, and obviously met, but I've I've off, I've interviewed all four of these terrific theater leaders from the Washington area um, many times, and uh, I have tremendous admiration and respect for what they do, uh, and. It is a it is a it is a pleasure uh, to gather and to let you out there uh, hear what they have to say about theater going forward from this moment. It's probably a, a fact that there is not a live performance going on in this country, or maybe most of the world right now. I mean, an entire art form is in stasis. It's shocking to contemplate the, the scale of this. And I know, and we all know on this panel that people are suffering in many more uh, uh, life-threatening ways, but the life of the theater matters greatly to all of us. And we wanna convey that to all of you in, in, in the ways in which we can express what, what's going on in the theater. So I'm gonna start with that. Welcome to you all. If you would each um, tell us what the state of your theater is at this moment, you're all in shutdown. How long do you, at this point, plan for that to be happening? What are your expectations for reopening? And how serious a problem are you facing right now with the closing of your theaters? Can we start maybe with Maria? <sighs> Damn you! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm, by, and I'm, I'll drink to you because I am drinking. It's five o'clock. So anyway. Oh, great, man. Okay. Um, so, uh, Willie Mammoth is a theater company in downtown Washington D.C. Has been around for forty years. This is our fortieth anniversary, and our um, 
what we do is uh, make plays that are uh, attempting to engage with our artists and audiences in um, unexpected, challenging, provocative ways, right? Which is why we traffic mostly in new plays. Uh, we've been shut down or we closed the building um, at the end of business day of uh, St. Patrick's Day, actually. Uh, and we uh, were uh, in the middle of rehearsal for There's Always the Hudson by Paola Lazaro. We were about two weeks in and we were racing against the clock to try and actually get something on video or something to happen so that we could actually share out with all the ticket buyers who were really excited about the show. And uh, we saw the shutdown coming. And so on that day, we brought in um, a film crew from Signature, actually, James Gardner, Matthew Gardner's twin brother and his crew to come in and actually tape some of the rehearsals. So we have a little bit of footage um, working on postponing that into next season. Um, right now, probably um, going to announce that we're doing the same with Teenage Dick by Mike Liu, which was supposed to start performances on June 1st. Uh, and as of today, in case you, I mean, I just read it today, I think maybe it was online yesterday. Um, our mayor has uh, said that um, she thinks that we're not gonna actually peak and start to flatten the curve until mid-June, early July. So that has a lot of implications for our NSFW festival, which is a festival about sex and body positivity we were supposed to do this summer. Um, but I, uh, I haven't moved forward on that yet because we're in the middle of being in triage mode. So we moved to teleworking really fast, um, which is hard. And we can all talk about the difficulties of teleworking. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and some jobs have it easier than others, for sure. And um, right now we have not yet had to furlough or lay off staff, um, but given the, um, given the length of what it is that we're uh, potentially facing. Um, we're not immune to the, the impacts on philanthropy and on uh, patron behavior that other uh, arts organizations, particularly performing arts organizations, are um, going to be impacted by. So, uh, so I just want to be realistic about that as well. Uh, Raymond, how about Theater Alliance, uh, a, a theater in Anacostia, one of the more hard pressed parts of the city? Um, you do some really interesting pieces by um, artists of color and others, but tell me where you guys are at the moment. Yeah, so Theater Alliance produces socially conscious, thought-provoking work in Ward 8 here in Anacostia. Uh, we, were going, we are in our 17th season. We actually were in the middle of a run of a really beautiful play called This Bitter Earth by Harrison David Rivers. Um, and that play in the third week had to come down. And so we closed that show very quickly. Um, and you know, the, the truth of the matter is the end of a run is actually when we see a majority of our ticket sales. And so this is a huge hit for us organizationally. And then past that, uh, we're unable to then move through the rest of our season. We were excited to end our season with Salma Yeni 24's The Blackest Battle, which was a new work that we've been developing for the last two years. Um, you know, when the pandemic occurred, I couldn't bring a staff back in to do something as simple as striking a set. And so for the first week and a half of the pandemic, I actually was in the theater by myself striking that set, taking it all apart. Um, so I have guns now, so <laughs> I am very strong. <laughs> it was a great opportunity to prove that I could do it. But it, it talks to, I think, and speaks to the size of our organization. When, when things like this happen, uh, it, it hurts because we are a staff, we are a very small team. Um, I am the only full-time staff member, and then I have four really brilliant women that are doing really full-time work for part-time pay. Um, so no, I don't have to furlough anyone, but what this has done is it's thrown a major wrench. It takes a long time for five people to do all of the work of a major organization. And so now to reimagine our next season, that's that's where we are. Um, I, I'm excited to say that we are committed to still producing The Blackest Battle. Uh, so The Blackest Battle will be in our new season, but we're also looking at now ways to um, move forward. How do we move forward and how are we nimble? Um, uh, thanks, Raymond. Uh, uh, Ryan, what's the, uh, Roundhouse is a, a large company in Bethesda, Maryland. 
you do very ambitious work uh, on a large scale musical plays. What is the impact at this point on the of the shutdown? Are we are you gonna are things gonna fall out of your schedule because you can't now produce them? Yeah, so we're an eight million dollar company in Bethesda, three hundred forty eight seat theater. Um, we were we made a decision pretty early because we were in the early part part of the rehearsal process, and we were one of the first companies to just say, you know, we're early enough on that we can cut. And stop rehearsals for cost of living right now. Um, we've had to cancel our entire fall season. I mean, the spring season. So everything from cost of living, big love, hate fuck, our gala. Uh, as And what we're deciding right now is when we think summer camp can start, if it can start. Um, we have summer camps that are supposed to start mid-June. Uh, as Maria was saying, like I feel like more and more June is looking highly unlikely. Uh, we are looking at, you, you had said earlier, what are we planning for? What are we uh, expecting? I mean, we're planning for everything. That's, that's the, the reality of where we are right now because there's just too many variables. So we are looking at models where we start summer camp July, you know, June, July, August. We're looking at models where we start the season in September with Quixote Nuevo, our first show of the season as well as the possibility of it extending much further. And then there's so many other questions around this in terms of what it means with audience sizes, with you know uh, individual giving, I think in particular, given what's happening with the economy right now. So lots of big questions that we're trying to map out all the different contingencies for. The good news is that we, um, we're in a pretty good place right now. I mean, we definitely need supports. Um, we have reached out to our board and to our major donors as a starting place, but we think we'll, we will be able to last until September without having to lay off any employees, provided that we can really, you know, get summer camp going and that we can actually start building the first show of the year, um, Quixote Nuevo, in August. It's one of the big questions I think that we're all trying to grapple with is not just when our social gatherings going to be allowed over a certain size that makes it realistic for us to do shows, but also when will the stay at home orders be lifted so that we can even get our folks in to start building the shows, which have to happen, you know, a good month and a half before the show actually goes up. So um, we are just planning for lots of different contingencies right now, but for the moment we're doing pretty well. We've got a lot of online content coming out. Um, so we're, we're just trying to keep, keep rolling right now. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Jason, you're at, on a campus. Olney Theater Center is a campus in Olney, Maryland, in central Montgomery County. Just about uh, an easy ride from downtown D.C. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, many forms of transit available, and Jason will drive you to the theater himself if he has to. <laughs> but is that an advantage right now? You're out in the country, so to speak. Uh, is that an advantage? Is there a, a, a shorter time frame for you to reopen because the uh, maybe it's a little bit, there's more open space. People might yeah. not be quite as confined. Yeah, uh, I think it's a great question, uh, Peter. I don't think that I don't think it makes us any more nimble in terms of coming back. Uh, as Ryan was saying, you know, we all have to get the same so, sort of the same restarting of the engine as everybody else. Uh, but I do think that uh, our geography are, uh, here in central Montgomery County, um, uh, just because there's a lot more space out here, people do have a, at least at the start of the crisis, it felt like people had a greater sense of security coming to the theater. We were running like Maria, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we were running like uh, Raymond um, in the second week of a show, The Amateurs, weirdly enough, about a group of theater people doing theater in the plague, uh, the 14th century plague. Uh, and we were surprised that we had, even in that last weekend before we closed it, 60, 70, 75% of our tickets were actually being picked up and people coming to watch the show, um, which we really thought, you know, nobody would show up. But I think our geography gives people a bit, at that moment, was giving people a bit of a sense of security. I don't know that that'll be the case on the coming out of this, right? I think everybody's a little bit, everybody's so anxious at the moment. Uh, and so we did cancel the amateurs. It's running on, we were streaming it through the end of the weekend of this very weekend. And then we postponed the humans till next year, 
We have two musicals uh, in June and July, Pippin and Two Pianos, Four Hands, which are on our calendar. Uh, stay tuned until next week and we'll let you know what's happening with those because obviously the news of this past week is such that it's a little scary. But, but, but like us, we're feeling, like uh, Ryan, we are uh, feeling hopeful that if we can reopen in September, even with some amount of social distancing in the house, we should be okay. We won't have to furlough any staff or anything, knock wood. We've got a lot riding on um, the Federal Stimulus Act and these small business loans. The Paycheck Protection Act, frankly, is uh, if, it, if it works the way it's supposed to work, is gonna be huge. Yeah. Huge for saving tons of um, uh, jobs in the sector. And by the way, John, uh, uh, I see your question. I'm going to answer your question about Top Dog Underdog later. Uh, and I have uh, Lisa Traeger uh, is remonstrating with me. She says, Peter only is a suburb, not the countryside. And I <laughs> think that's a matter of opinion. And I'm an opinion journalist. <laughs> so I, for me, it's the country, Lisa. Um, and I'll, I'll, we'll have to have a separate panel on that discussion. <laughs> um, this is okay. Thank you all for the for the uh, for the opening remarks. Uh, what are you? I this is for everybody. And and what are you most worried about today? What is your biggest fear right now in terms of your theater company? I'm glad you said today because uh, it changes every single day. Sometimes numerous <laughs> times a day, depending on what no. is in the news. For me, the biggest thing today is uh, a fear that uh, one of the things that I've been you know, reading in a couple of different articles and hearing a couple of different people say is that there's a strong possibility that the limit on social gathering would not be lifted into, possibly not be lifted until um, we have a vaccine, until we have a vaccine and there's enough people getting the vaccine that we can feel safe to do that. That other, that we might relax some of the other restrictions before then, uh, we might go in and out of social distancing uh, during periods where it's, you know, come back in a second wave if it does that, but that we may be looking at a much longer period. And, you know, if all of us are looking at shutting down until the start of our 22, 23 season, September 22, that's a, that's a, that's a, a very different problem for us to face than shutting down for six months and reopening in September. Because? Well, I mean, you know, the in this kind of situation, I think the, the key word, what Jason said is nimble, right? We You want to be in a position where when it's time, when people are ready to come back to the theater, we're ready to give them something dynamic and bold and exciting, something that draws them to the theater. In order to do that, you have to have enough staff in place on a, and enough people ready to go and enough planning done that you can launch a show right away. But if you have to wait, you know, if we don't know, if we have to continually say, is this show gonna go forward? No, it's not. Is this show gonna go forward? No, it's not. Then we're constantly putting out money in advance to design the show, to at least hire the artists, start the designing of shows, start laying out money to create those products. And then, you know, the uh, sorry, I shouldn't say that word because I hate that word when talking about art products, but to create those shows. And then if we have to cancel them, we're constantly expending money where we don't have to. If we knew now that if the governor or the, well, I'll say if the governor, I won't say the president, but if the governor said uh, strongly right now that the rule is going to be that we're not going to have gatherings of over a hundred people, let's say, until a vaccine is in place. That would give us some sense of how to move forward. Right now, a lot of what we're having to do, Peter, is just plan and guess, plan and guess, and try to figure out where are those places where we make decisions so that we're not expending too much money and getting ourselves in a position where we have, uh, where we're not ready to launch in a big way when audiences return. And it's this problem that you talked about about. You know, I think in their industry as a whole, most organizations have less than six months operating expenses on hand. Um, there are lots of great government programs that are starting to come out. That Paycheck Protection Program, I think in particular, because it could become uh, forgiven as a grant if you keep your employees on for, I think, eight weeks, that could be huge for us. But if this lasts 18 months, 
uh, we would be in a position where I think we would need a lot more government stimulus. So all of which is to say, that's my fear today. Um, and that is, it's a different fear than yesterday. And I, I hope to God it's not a fear that is going to come true and that it's not something that we really need to spend a lot of time worrying about, but it is my current fear. Uh, yeah. Are any of you are any of you worried that your companies won't exist at the end of this crisis? I'll be honest and say that I, I am a bit nervous about that. Uh, you know, black and brown communities will be disproportionately affected by this event. And when I look at my community here in Anacostia, a very black and brown community, um, life is still happening. Violence is still happening in my community. I'm still hearing gunshots. Businesses are still being broken into in my community. And so when we start thinking about how we recover, uh, I, I am nervous that an audience base that I've been attempting to build as we attempt to continue to build community and bring back a subset of people who have been disenfranchised from theater space forever. So as I've been trying to build this community, the pandemic happens. And so is that trust lost? Will my audience come back? That's a major question for us. Maria? Yeah, I mean, I, right now, the thing that's keeping me up at night is like, is, is, is just my blinders are on in terms of the next show or the next thing or et cetera. It's really so difficult to plan so far in advance as Ryan's talking about. And I, um, you know, it's a very big difference if we don't do our first show, um, you know what I mean? Or if we don't do anything in the fall. Um, and, and even in thinking about sort of, you know, I know that there's some comments about online uh, content and, and those kinds of products and stuff. You know, I, I, I will do everything I can to make sure that art and the performing arts uh, is flourishing in whatever possible way, even if it is through this medium. But there is nothing like gathering <laughs> in a group and feeling that energy and, um, and, be, and, and riding the wave of, of uh, emotions that you go through in, 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 a, in an audience, you know? I, I believe society's missing something by not actually gathering. And that doesn't mean that I don't think it's essential to make sure that we are uh, being safe and caring for those who, um, you know, maybe, um, again, you know, black and brown folks disproportionately um, affected by this as well as our older patrons. So, um, so I, to be honest, I'm in that same boat of like, literally ask me this question every hour and, uh, <laughs> and it changes. <laughs> yeah. Um, it really does. Jason, are you, are, what is your, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> besides um, everything. Uh, yeah, besides everything. Um, uh, you know, I think, uh, I certainly agree with these folks. The question for us, I mean, Only Theater is 82 years old. It'll come back. Is it going to come back in any recognizable form to what we've built over the past seven years is a big question. I mean, uh, Only Theater was a touring house for a very long time. It did close during World War II for a number of years and came back. Um, the thing that keeps me up at night is, am I going to... if If the only way to bring back audiences to do big blockbuster jukebox musicals I don't want to be there for that. So what, you know, is there going to be a place for what we've built, what Raymond has built for the community Anacostia, what we're building. I think what Ryan and I are both building in Montgomery County for adventurous theater goers is the audience for that going to come back. We've been cultivating it so hard and for so long. So, so will we come back in a recognizable form? And I think the other thing that, that, that I'm very fearful about and that does keep me up at night, um, you know, uh, and there was a great article in the post with Tracy Oliveira and Evan Casey, uh, the picture of them, sure. um, about freelance artists in this community are among the hardest hit in this crisis and certainly the hardest hit among us, um, certainly anybody here on the panel. Uh, uh, um, you know, is there going to be a flight to rep companies and our our, our Freelance artists going to say, you know what? Enough of this. Enough. You know, we plan what sort of go back to what Ryan was saying. We plan a year and a half in advance, two years in advance for a lot of the plays that we do. These actors, the best actors in DC, who have 
and the DMV artistic community has grown and gotten so much better. And I see some of them are here on the call right now. I'm seeing notes from Paige Hathaway, set designer, about about my mic possibly rubbing on my collar. Thank you, Paige. Um, uh, but you know these uh, uh, um, freelance artists who book themselves ahead for a year and a half, two years, suddenly are looking to not have any work for the foreseeable future. If this continues for a long time, are any of those folks going to be like, as you know, as Paige? Paige, please don't, but are you gonna say what, say, you know what, I'd rather work for, you know, do drafting for, for Disney or a movie studio. Sure. Um, so, so the thing that is sort of keeping me awake in the long-term way is, uh, uh, is our community of freelance artists that's so amazing in the DMV gonna come back. Um, that's strong. Um, okay, so, so thinking about the future a little bit, I got an email today from a, a, a woman named Maggie Heineman. And she wrote to me and said, uh, when venues reopen, will they attract mostly older people packed tightly for hours and coughing a lot? I am 83 and attend many, many uh, uh, events a year. I believe that I would be protected if everyone around me were wearing a face mask. Arts organizations could encourage seniors to return by requiring fa face masks, which would be provided at the entrance to the building. Uh, is this the, the world that you're envisioning? I mean, are you thinking in terms of audience protection as a part of your service provision to the uh, to uh, your your uh, patrons? I mean, I think that's part of the social contract, right? It's so strange. I had a dream the other day and I woke up in like a fit of panic because I was taking a customer's ticket, a patron's ticket, and I asked, we actually take temperatures now. Can I go ahead and take your temperature? Wow. And I held one of those temperature guns up to their head and I woke up like, oh my God, is that the future? Um, but yeah. you know, as we start thinking about the future of pandemics, um, yeah, I think that that might be where at least we are headed. We are a smaller venue. We're a resident company at the Anacostia Playhouse. So our audiences naturally have to be very close to one another. Um, so possibly, yeah, that's something very real I think we all have to consider. The panel agrees. I was yes. going to say, I'm, I'm curious to know who's going to be, what, which major theater is going to be the first that has temperature checks at the door, because it's going to happen. Uh, and certainly something that, that some of the, that, that we've been talking about at only in the fall is, you know, we have, we are very lucky that we have these large theaters. Can we increase the number of performances we do in a week and cut the number of audiences, audience members by half so that people are in every other, uh, every other row? It's not something that um, you know that can happen at Theater Alliance, or, or would be really tough at Woolly, I think. But and then we also have an outdoor theater, and so you know, can we? It, all the research is saying people are going to come back to outdoor events sooner than they will to indoor. So you know, we're thinking about how can we activate our outdoor space um, and outdoor theater. But that's you know, uh, uh, but yeah, we're all going to have to take some sort of precautions for for audience safety, legitimate audience safety, and also, let's face it, uh, the perception of audience safety, because perception is a big part of this battle for, for anybody in any live event. You know, one of the things that I keep thinking about is sort of when is the moment, and I'm trying to, I promise you, I'm trying to, to think abundantly and, and be able to actually brainstorm some sort of like pivoting and nimbleness for ourselves, you know, and I think about like, I don't know, for, for me, for Wooly, um, all of Washington, D.C. can be our stage frankly. And so I've been thinking about what that could look like for us. Um, it just, uh, uh, and so, and what are the different ways that we can actually sort of create woolly-like experiences um, and still keep folks safe um, that may not depend on people packed together like sardines, which, you know, is usually a market, mark of success for us <laughs> and will not be a mark of success in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. Uh you know, and the, the to get like even more practical here, let me introduce the kryptonite issue of ticket prices. Are we thinking that we're gonna, you know, people are gonna be making choices on a different scale. You know, I can see spending the money and risking my life to see Hamilton, but if it's not gonna be that kind of experience, that wow, once in a lifetime night in the theater, do I want to fork over 85, 90 bucks to see a show that I may not like? Um, what What are we thinking? At, you know, does the does the whole economic sort of equation of how you think 
of the value of what you do and you put a number on it change with this change in patrons and, and audiences uh, fears and worries about what they're doing? Sure. I mean, I think the, you know, again, a lot of this depends, Peter, on on when in the future we're talking about, right? I think, you know, once a vaccine is developed, this is a, it, I, I do think it will be a period of time, but we will return to some form of normalcy, something that that uh, is similar to where we have been. How long it will take to get back to where we just were? is very hard to say right now and it depends on how long this lasts right but at some point we're going to come back it's and, and i think you know it, it just sort of depends on how long it lasts is going to depend on how many theaters are around at the end of that and how quickly we can ramp back up and how back you know how quickly we get back to normal size in the meantime i mean the good news about dynamic pricing which i think we all for the most part have moved to is that dynamic pricing is not just about raising your prices up Dynamic pricing is about raising your, you know, lowering your prices when necessary. And I think we're going to all have to be, uh, business as usual has gone out the window during this period. If we are going to be producing at all during the period where we don't yet have a vaccine, but we have gotten things to the point where they're manageable and hospitals are not overloaded and, uh, and we can open things back up again. If we get to that point, which I sure hope we do. Yeah, absolutely. We're all going to have to pay attention to how clean our facilities are, how we're distancing people in the facilities. How, as Jason said, like how we provide confidence to people who, um, you know, have fears because I think fear is gonna be driving a lot of this and a lot of the decision-making process. Um, can we produce in different venues that provide uh, more space for people? And on top of all of that, what is the price of all of this? Absolutely, all those things are on the table. Uh, you know, it's interesting, somebody mentions here uh, Audrey Elizabeth Emmett uh, mentions uh, the protection for musicians, singers, but also actors, I think, is going to be a more interesting, you know, I've noticed that when I watch, even when I watch shows on television now and I see people, you know, all over each other in, 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 in Netflix series, it feels like another time. It feels like, a, a, like the Stone Age, really. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but when I see people hugging on television, I'm like, oh my God, that looks so nice. I just want to hug a bunch of people. <laughs> that, of course. Remember when? But I mean, are they're going to be, you know, are, the question is, you know, are you going to have, are, are plays going to have to consider, you know, oh, well, wait a minute, we can't really do that on a stage right now. It's We're not yet ready for that kind of intimacy. Uh, or, uh, you know, does it, is that really a silly thing to try to like? You know, I'm really nervous about, to be honest, this goes to uh, musical theater and musicals and such. So one of the things that happened in New York is like, there's the conversation about a choir. They did all of the getting, you know, um, cleaning and they were far apart from each other and that kind of stuff. But the fact that they were like singing in the air, actually they got sick. So, um, so oh. I, 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 I agree. I think that this is, this is really scary. And this is the thing that's going to keep me up at night tonight. So thanks everybody. <laughs> of course. Frank, that's my job to keep you up at night. My, Marie. <laughs> my work is done here. Um, uh, you know, and interestingly, a sidelight to that is somebody mentioned to me today, and I hope my editors are hearing this, that, you know, criticism may become a more important factor again uh, with the idea that people are going to be looking for that extra level of assurance that what they're seeing is something someone else thought was okay. Uh, you know, I mean, not to, that is, you know, I don't know if that's true, but I'm just saying that this is a possibility, but it does make you think about all the elements of the ecosystem that could be affected by just a shift in people's attitudes. I also yeah, think, I think you're absolutely right. And I also think neighborhood theaters, theaters that identify with a particular neighborhood or a part of the city or a part of a region are going to be in better shape because people are not going to want to a go as far and be instead of this sort of um, uh, multiple choice of I'm going to go to this place and this place and this place all over the region. There's going to be that sense of wanting to support my neighborhood more than yeah. there has been, I hope. You know, there's an interesting thing, and it's something that Raymond touched on. Well, you're all sort of, you know, here's an interesting, the mindset that Maggie Heinemann mentioned in her, you know, this idea that older people would be more nervous about coming back. You know, younger people, I'm just noticing in general, are less um, anxious 
They, they are not that they don't think this is a problem, but they're not quite as ready to change their lifestyles as older people are. But is there is one of the possible outcomes here that that the theater shifts towards a younger audience, uh, that younger people think of it as a place to congregate as older people is or maybe that's, you know, maybe I'm like, you know, 25 years ahead of myself here. But I, I just want smoking crack. <laughs> I'm drinking. I'm drinking. Um, I mean, maybe if that, maybe if the ticket price co uh, question that you asked actually forces us to do twenty, twenty-five dollar kind of tickets, and it's not just student rush, but anybody under the age of thirty-five, then maybe, yeah. I, don't know. I will say that that's the success that we, I think, are seeing at Theater Alliance. We're seeing a younger audience, a more diverse audience. But I think that that's the consequence of, yeah, our programming, but also our ticket price. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm hoping that our audiences, our younger audiences, are willing to come back. D, D. Scott Graham mentions, he says, I really do think audiences will return. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Uh, I think the trick is going to be remaining in folks' minds and keeping relevant. How the hell do you do that? Well, I will say to your to your point earlier about critics and if we begin leaning on the idea of critics more, I hope that if that is the case, then we have a larger diversity of critics because I think how we are criticizing work is incredibly important. Um, mm -hmm. And then how we do that, I think we do that by being, to Jason's point, very local. Um, mm -hmm. I think that I am looking to into this next season and wondering how am I specifically serving DC? What are the stories that we need to actually here to heal because our cultural organizations which we all are are supposed to do that be that place for us to heal so thinking very deeply about how we are healing and how we're creating space for that in our theaters that makes sense to me keeping and that goes to that issue of keeping relevant what do you other guys think in terms of how does your programming have to conform to what this changing environment what this environment we're all living in has brought Oh. Jason, yeah. you want to start? Uh, <laughs> sure. I think we're all going to, you know, we, we uh, as artistic directors, the, the wonderful and most awful part of our job is getting to choose a season of plays and then and <laughs> having to choose that season of plays like a year, two years in advance. Uh, and when things are changing every day, it's extremely difficult to know what people are going to want. People are going to want to heal. The theater has always been a crucible whereby a community processes its demons um, and celebrates its triumphs together. But what are those going to be next year? Are we going to be able to be, I, I do think that, that one thing that's going to change about how we move forward is we are going to be forced to be more nimble in thinking about can that play be a concert if I need to turn it into a concert at some point or into a, into something that I can put on at a moment's notice at a smaller ticket, at, at a lower ticket price and so on. I think that, that that'll be one of the changes that we see. Um, I certainly think there's going to be, I already got from our season announcement this morning, um, uh, uh, a couple of emails saying, yay, thank you for doing all that adventurous work. And a couple of people saying at this time, can't you just give me Brigadoon? I just want to see the Brigadoon that I saw 20. I'm sure she's probably watching Karen. I'm sorry if you're watching, I'm using your, yeah, uh, you watched this morning. So you're probably watching now. Um, I, I think those two, the, 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 those two polls of the experience that people want, I just don't want to think about it. And I want only to think about what we're doing. You know, that's going to really be um, uh, 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 those are going to pull us in both two different directions. Mm. You know, I, I so I know you told us this wasn't about advertising, Peter, but too bad. I'm going to uh, I want to tell everybody about playathome.org. Uh, so a bunch of theaters got together and actually micro commissioned playwrights and are inviting other theaters to do the same if they're able. Um, it's uh, we gave five hundred dollars a playwright. Um, each of the theaters picked five or more um, playwrights and created five to ten minute plays. For, that are unproducible for folks to read and enjoy with multi-generational audiences at home. So the reason I bring this up is the question about how do we stay relevant? I actually think part of this is about 
uh, thinking about new forms in that way and what is what is happening right now, right? And so, um, one, we were thinking, let's get some money in some artists' pockets because they just lost a lot of work. Um, two, let's make something really bite-sized so that folks can do it at home and not feel like they have to have professionals or various things like that. And three, the biggest guideline for that, actually, to speak to your Brigadoon comment, we actually gave a guideline that said, um, make it joyful. Because we did not feel like this was about, this was a moment where we wanted to um, ask playwrights to really sort of speak seriously about what's going on. We wanted to actually bring some joy into people's lives. Well, that, so actually, that, actually, that actually does answer the, um, the uh, that, uh, that, that person's question. I, I wasn't saying don't tell me anything you're doing, uh, Maria. I'm glad that sounds like a good No, but I was just so blatantly like, go visit this website, yeah. please. <laughs> Enjoy it. That's a story I'd like to write. I just haven't had time. Uh, and I, I will get around to that, uh, which does lead us to this other sort of phenomenon of uh, online theater. And I have to tell you, you know, I try and watch it. It's very hard to watch theater on TV on a TV screen or a or a, on a laptop screen. I, it's just not what I'm accustomed to, and I think it probably is a substitute for some people. But does it meet the guidelines for all of you of of a of a of a way of keeping relevant and keeping in people's minds? Is that what it's for, or is you know what is it for? Jason, you're shaking your head. Oh, I mean, I, there was, uh, I'm not a big fan of Peter Gelb from the Metropolitan Opera, but he did write a great op-ed piece this morning, uh, which basically said, would, um, would Mozart perform for you via Zoom? Uh, uh, and there's nothing, in, in the essence of his, uh, the, the idea behind his story, uh, his op-ed piece was, listen, yes, it's great. We're releasing tons of operas from our catalog and, um, and some of us are streaming plays and some of us are, we're all creating online content like this among other things, but none of it uh, can possibly replace what happens when, as Maria said earlier, and I know all of us on this panel agree, when we all sit in the same space. If only because the, uh, the, the performers are responding, even I'm sitting here on this, uh, I can see the live comments. I'm responding to the energy coming out of those live comments. So that's, I mean, and that's like that's the littlest version of a live experience. Um, I think I think what is important is that we create um, while this is happening other kinds of experience, like what Maria is talking about. We're doing. We have a thing. Share your story. We're encouraging people to come on our website and record their own stories, which we'll perform uh, later when we can gather. Um, so do things that are not theater, because when you come back, experience what theater really is, which is special. Yeah. Jared Taylor. I, oh, go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. No, I'm just going to say, I, I just want to uh, piggyback on that, because I, I really feel like that's the way we've been certainly approaching it. it, it it's not a question for us about remaining relevant. It's a, it's a question about continuing to uh, communicate in a regular basis to our community to continue to have a community, to build a digital community, to save the people who come to us for that healing that Raymond's talking about, for those uh, emotional cathartic experiences that make life worth living, um, that we're saying to them, look, we're not gonna do theater right now because theater is something that happens in a room with live people. Theater is about us breathing together in the same space with the performers and feeling their you know, literally connecting our heartbeats together as we watch this show. We can't do that. What we can do is to, is to treat you as the same kind of patron and ask ourselves, how do we serve you while we're in this situation together? And how do we do something similar to what we would normally do? So for us, we've been thinking about things like, well, we have classes for three different age groups of students. Let's put things online that are similar. Let's put educational challenges out there that are for K through three, four through six, and, and teenagers that kids gives kids something to do during the week. We do lots of post-show discussions and um, communications with our uh, you know panels and things like that with our, with our audience. And so we created this thing called Playwrights on Plays where Gabrielle is interviewing different playwrights about a play that's in the public domain that they can um, read beforehand and ask the playwright questions about and get to know the playwright a little bit better. 
And we've got a bunch of other content that I, I'm desperate to talk about, but I can't yet because we haven't announced it yet. Um, but that will mirror different parts go, of, go ahead. of our I, my marketing team would kill me because we're yeah. announcing it next week. But um, things that mirror different parts of our organization, like we have this great new bar that we just created with the new theater space that we've only been in for six months. I mean, we literally, we we reopened the theater in September and we shut it down in, in March. And that has been a big uh, boon for us. It's been a, a different way for people to connect around us is to come early, to stick around late, to do all the things we want, we're trying to do with them in conversation before. So we created something called our weekly quarantini where they're, uh, Hudson who runs our bars, not only teaching people how to make cocktails that they can make at home, but introducing people to the providers that we work with and saying, hey, support your local businesses as well. I, I feel like a lot of what we're doing right now is simply trying to make sure that our community is still turning to us is that we're not just asking for something from them at all times, that we're constantly trying to give them something as well. Um, because we are going to need to ask. We are going to need their support to stay open. And when we reopen, we're, we're going to need their support when we finally reopen. What those shows are, how we program, I mean, going back to something you said before, I just I, I wanted to mention that I think, you know, one of the really interesting things that could happen, um, just playing the sort of long, long game here, is that you know if older audience members who are primarily the subscribers of theater at this point, if the baby boom generation decides to a large extent that they're not gonna subscribe to the theater as much as they did in the past, I think we could be looking at a change in, in just the whole idea of a subscription model and moving more and more to um, either a membership model like we see at a place like the public where Maria was for a long time or something like what we see in the UK where we're announcing maybe two or three, you know, we're announcing a, a fall season, a winter season, a spring season. Um, but that this idea of relying on year long subscribers that are an older audience base primarily uh, and having to move more to sort of event kind of programming that brings in more single ticket buyers uh, and, and, and is about cultivating a group of people that sort of stick with you, your members who stick with you throughout because they love what you do. Uh, I think that's gonna become more and more important having that, you know, that idea of being hyper local while at the same time having a sort of international reach. So what about, I'll ask you and Maria, I'm just gonna ask so to follow up with that. So to go back to someone who said the idea of rep companies where you have actors employed in your company who can be um, marshaled to do anything on the turn of a dime or much more quickly because you don't have to go out and cast or worry about their availability to do plays on a shorter time frame so that you're not necessarily programming a year from now when things could be completely different in the world. Uh, maybe that is part of a, of a rethink of how, you know, using some of the ideas of the past to make these things possible to turn on a dime, to be more to be more fluid, flexible. I am thrilled about this. This is why I want to jump up and down and, <laughs> and talk and talk about it. Because to me, you know, I don't know if you all remember um JT Rogers had a show, I think it was about the Rwandan genocide. Do you remember oh, that? Yeah, the overwhelming. What was that? What's the name of that show? The overwhelming. The overwhelming. Yeah, amazing show, right? Smart but you know, not. he he wrote that show really close to when that's Stuff was happening. It did get programmed. We didn't actually get to see it in theaters for like two, three years after after the whole thing occurred. So one of the things that I actually think is so uh, a really exciting opportunity is actually to think a little bit more. Um, so uh, uh, you know, it's it's almost like I don't like making decisions late, but I do like responding to what's happening in the world. And I do like theater being able to respond to what's happened in the world and or what's happening with a writer who writes a play and goes, I have this amazing script, can you do it? And everybody's like, yeah, two or three years from now, totally. Right. <laughs> Which yeah. I think, I actually think one of the things that you're talking about is at the heart of this is like, how do we actually get again, more flexible, adaptable, nimble in that way. And, and that may mean also sort of investing um, in our artists. I, I actually, I want to say personally, that must mean investing in our artists um, and investing in stage managers and designers and folks 
in our communities, right? So that we can actually employ them and keep them around. <laughs> um, because Lord knows every time I see all the job postings of other things people could do, I sort of, there's a part of me that's like, yes, make money, but also like, please come back to the theater too. And will you be able to make a living in the theater? Now, la final point before I uh, leave, <laughs> give up the <laughs> floor. So the, the thing that I think we haven't spoken about that Ryan touched on in terms of needing people's support. So in online content, even Berkeley Rep, ACT, and others who have made the streaming thing happen, right? There is no substitute. So I just want to say it's probably a third, if that, of the ticket revenue that they expected on that show. So one of the things that that is really sort of just behind the scenes kind of stuff that folks don't because you know we're nonprofit organizations so everything that we get and from supporters we basically put back into the organization one of the ways that makes us be able to take risks have a little bit of a larger cast and I'm talking about like seven or eight people instead of four or three you know uh, be able to do music be able to have uh, musicians is actually this this calculus between the ticket revenue and the earned revenue and um, and the contributed revenue and so this is the part where it gets really tricky in the online content world because this is new for us and we're we are I mean Wooly is going to throw a virtual party on April 20th um, to I mean if you tune in if you want to see me make a fool of myself please um, but essentially it's going to attempt to we're, we need to uh, experiment with fundraising on an online platform. Brian from Step Africa just talked about this on the live comments, and I think you're right. It's just basically thinking about it in different ways, but also planning for the fact that it's never going to actually be a full substitute uh, for us because because suddenly, you know, we we are not going to compete with Netflix and Amazon no, Prime no. and Disney Plus. No, no. You know, it's just that's not what we do. Um, so we'll come back. We'll come back leaner, and we'll come back smarter, uh, and we'll take what we can online. Uh, but absolutely, just the the model that we use is is an essential and expensive one because it's human capital every day, every night. Um, I want to make sure with about ten minutes left that we we do take some time if if we want for comments. Peter, I, I leave it to you to moderate. Um, and I also do want to say there has already been some talk uh, before this started about this being. A recurring series perhaps with other guests they don't have to be this group of people can be with freelance artists could be whatever um, if you're interested in that shoot me an email jason at only and i'll pass that on to folks who are interested but yeah so yeah we have limited time so let me shoot a couple of questions at you andrew cisna asks us the lighting designer how do we best plan for the next time this happens what does virtual performance look like in other words i guess is this a, is this something, are we, you know, we're, we're dancing around this, this idea that digital has a, has a role here, it, yes or no, or both, everybody, no one seems to know, but is this now have to be built into the uh, DNA of a theater company to, to anticipate the unanticipated? I mean, you all have how much working capital left? I mean, you don't have much. How do you how do, how do you build this into the structure of a nonprofit theater? Peter, I don't know. I mean, sort of to what a lot of people have been saying, I don't know that, that digital is ever, in fact, I shouldn't say I don't know. I know for a fact digital cannot ever compete, you know, compete with what we do live, right? And we can't compete with digital. We're gonna explore digital storytelling, but we're doing it in a way that is very much simply about creating stories by local artists for the local community. It's not about trying to create like something that would be uh, ever making money for us, ever, you know, becoming a commercial product. I don't think that's what it's about. I think the way you, you need to be, I think it, the new theaters uh, uh, that emerge out of this, I am quite confident that the idea of having, um, either for designated reserves or you know, facility reserves, some kind of disaster reserves, like having money set aside to actually deal with this stuff. We're an industry that has built itself in many ways on this, on this antiquated idea of having a giant endowment, which in a situation like this does not actually help. It's restricted dollars. And I think you know, more and more what we're gonna be looking to is uh, building organizations that are not just more nimble and can move 
easily and program the kind of things that responding to the present moment, but also finding ways to be able to uh, have enough reserves on hand that we can last through anything that exists like this. And perhaps using digital as a way to further our communications with our community and to build anticipation for the kinds of live events that we really want to still do. But it will never be a full substitution. It will never be the thing that we become. I don't think we'll ever become film slash TV, you know, slash theater companies. Yeah, to that point, Leah Johnson says, a comment, if we don't take this moment of crisis to intentionally expand our audiences and reach out to those who ordinarily don't come to theater and whose stories are not consistently told, when we come back from this plague, the future of theater will likely be in jeopardy. Maria is right. We need to experiment and be radically inclusive in this moment. I mean, that's... I I love that. And I, I will say to the to that point, you know, I've been very quiet about this digital conversation because I, we're not participating and we're trying to be very intentional about how we're using online platforms, understanding that that's the only place we're connecting now. And so actually our audiences can see right through it. And so instead we're looking at using uh, our digital platform as places of empowerment. How are we staying in touch with our audiences by empowering them to share their stories with us? How are we empowering them and teaching them to create art as well and be participant in it? And then past that, we're using our social platforming to actually develop work that we are putting into our season. So I, there are opportunities there, I think. So, so that leads to Liam Gibbs's question, which is, this is a toughie, what advice might you have for early career artists and other theater workers just finishing school or postgraduate training, spending a flipping fortune to become artists um, who had hoped to be entering the field in the 2021 season? What, where is their intro? You know, I want to bring up, so we do have some data around this from the Great Recession um, and what has been happening with millennials um, basically going to debt to um, be able to get educated and then coming out and being unable to land a job. And, you know, you, there's so many, there's so many people at Woolly Mammoth. I am in awe of our staff and partly because the younger staff, they already have master's degrees. <laughs> I don't, I don't even have one. <laughs> it's like I'm just I because that's that's what's uh, that's what the world was like um, when they got out of school. Uh, I hate that, and I hate that that's happening. And I um, I want I want to also be realistic. What's happening with the economy? All of this stuff really unprecedented. All of this, the federal stimulus bill that happened in 2009, we're talking about two back to back, really unprecedented. So what I would say is like, I love the theater and also you have to take care of yourself and nourish yourself and figure out how you're going to actually survive after you come out of school. Because it's not, um, we're gonna attempt to take care of you, but this is not, uh, this is a really not an easy moment. Um, the, you know, and this is where I get really frustrated because a lot of the people who are going to be able to make it are people who are, you know, inheriting money and or have uh, have a, a base of support, financial support from their families, et cetera, whatever. And it's it really is going to be um, it's really going to disproportionately affect particularly people of color. No question. Yeah, right. I will say that I, I, I you know, as, as a former professor at Howard University, I, this is something that I often think about. How are young people moving into the field? And I think that's so important. Um, you know, in this moment, there are so many ways that you can still uh, be connected to the field. One, I think there are still opportunities for us to continue creating our art individually. And two, I think past that mentorship is so, so vitally important. When I think about the ways I moved through the scene and through my own career. I did that through mentorship, literally sending emails to artistic directors and saying, hey, I really like the work that you're doing. I am doing this. Can you offer any ideas up for me? Can you just have a conversation with me? Um, I, I think it's in those ways that we can still continue to learn and then advance and grow the field. That's lovely, Raymond. And that leads very nicely into a closing thought from Carlos Velasquez. And he said- ah, Carlos. He says it really well, and I endorse his uh, sentiments entirely. He says to the four of you, stay strong, informed, and connected. 
Your work is missed, and I look forward to seeing three to four shows a week. <laughs> and he will. <laughs> God bless you. My addiction of choice, theater, needs to be fed. So I would say to the four of you, uh, my addiction needs to be fed. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the viewers on here all need their addiction need to be fed. We need you to be thinking and doing and making theater again for us. And I thank you greatly for having uh, spent this hour with us to talk about what you're doing. And I wish you only the best over the next uh, few months. So thank you all. And thank you out there uh, to everyone who contributed. I'm sorry we didn't get to all your questions. Uh, be well, stay safe. Good night. Thank you all. Hi everyone. Thank, thank you. you.